What's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen. Get some. That's like a thing, too, man. We, you know, there's a myth out there about the size of a guy's thing is the size of his feet. That's an inch for you. If it is, man, think about Shaq. He's got 22 inch feet. Be careful, ladies. It's a public service announcement, man. You know, he has walking bow legged every time a leg come to Orlando. <laughs> Big man, ain't no lady gonna want 22 inches up in her. And that's the thing, man, as a guy, man, we don't have big ones. We don't have big things. We have a penis. That's all we got. We have a penis. We don't have a dick, we have a penis. You know, it's not a big word. It's not a big thing, you know? That's why we wear clothes, to cover up our small penis. You don't see nothing else. No other mammal on this planet wears clothes, do they? Now, you ever see like uh, the jungle and, and, uh, and the water? You ever see like a horse? That's a dick. That's a dick. We have a penis, a horse has a dick. That's why we talk, we talk to try to get some sex. I got a car, got a new job, baby, I'm clean. Come on, come on, let's do it. Horse ain't gotta talk. Got a big ass horse dick. Just flapping in the wind and shit, you know? You just be roaming around. Derby, the horse's dick is bigger than the jockey and stuff. <laughs> like, Damn. What a bitch. And some of these animals, man, they can do sexual feats I can only dream about, you know? Like a male lion, a male lion can mate up to 50 times a day, every day. That's why he's the king of the jungle right there. And stuff. I ain't see that part of Lion King. I gotta run that shit again. Oh, I missed that part. I wonder if Simba was power a little bit. Like a male pig, a male pig, a male pig can have a 30 minute orgasm. 30 minutes! That's why pigs are fat and lazy, they're tired! That's why the nose all pumping up in the front, the tail's all curled up in the back, and they make that noise. You have a 30 minute orgasm, you don't make that noise, I'm sorry. Just, oh, oh, shit! Oh, God! Oh, you smell bacon? You smell bacon? Oh, God. Ah, fuck my poor girl. Farming coming, what you want to eat? Just give me some slot bars. Yeah. I got two more heifers to do today. I can't even eat a ham sandwich no more, man. I can't even do that to the pig. I just be looking at him. Put it down, put it down. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. You can listen to this on iTunes. Just search Gary Owen, Get Some, or go to YouTube, watch it on my YouTube page, youtube.com backslash Gary Owen com. Uh, the, the Warriors just beat the Cavs in the NBA Finals. I'm a, I'm a Cavs fan. And I'm not really a Cavs fan. I am a LeBron James fan. So wherever he goes, I go. So, uh, you know, being from Cincinnati, I don't have a, I didn't grow up on, on a hometown team. When I grew up, my team was the Knicks because of Patrick Ewing. And then when the end of Patrick Ewing's career, it was hard to keep up. I mean, he went to the Orlando Magic. He went to the Seattle Supersonics. But I went wherever Ewing went and I, and I rooted for him. So I'm in the same way with LeBron. So, you know, uh, where he goes next year, I'm going to go. Um, but I will say this before I get into uh, the NBA finals, um, Currently, as I'm recording this, I'm actually in the Bay Area. It's a, it's a suburb called Pleasanton. I really think Northern California has the best mornings because even if it's going to be 80 degrees, the mornings are still a little cool. Like you can wear a hoodie or a sweatshirt, but you can wear shorts and a sweatshirt. And I'm a, I'm a coffee dude. I like to start my morning with, uh, with some coffee. Ain't nothing like a hot cup of coffee when it's when it's a little brisk outside. Like for the Midwest, if you've never been to the West Coast, it's like the fall when you wake up like September, October. That's what Northern California feels like in the morning. And then it still might get 80, 85 degrees, but the mornings are always seem like to be in the, the high 50s, low 60s. I just, I love that weather. So for me, there's no better mornings than Northern California on the on the West Coast. So anyways, I digress. So I've been here and, and they, they got great fans, but 
you know, everyone asks me, I don't, I don't lie. Who you rooting for? I'm like the Cavs. I'm a LeBron guy. So I've been getting it. I, I don't think I've ever, uh, I've ever seen LeBron James more frustrated. I mean, game one, JR makes the, the dumb play, wasn't locked into the game. And we find out LeBron like punched something in the locker room, bruised his hand, sprained his wrist a little bit. And, uh, if you, if you see the, some of the timeouts, man, like they, they released one of, of game one in between, uh, the fourth quarter and overtime and then game four, game three. I mean, he just, he's so frustrated. And I, I can't remember any other player where he completely holds the balance of power in his hands like LeBron. Like, basically next year, the two best teams are going to be Golden State and whatever team LeBron's on. That's going to be the two best teams. Everybody else is going to fall back. I don't care who everybody else gets. Um, Because a lot of people think Houston, because they went to, they went seven games with the the Warriors that, oh, they're ready to go. They're ready to go. But, I mean, Houston's got a lot of decisions to make. And it was all lined up this year. It was like a perfect storm for them to compete with the Warriors and beat them. And then Chris Paul pulls his hamstring. And, you know, they, they lost, they pretty much lost the series after that. But it reminded me of like when, when the Pacers had Reggie Miller and everybody said, watch out for them. They got the Bulls number, but they could never get past the Bulls or they couldn't get past the Knicks or they couldn't get past the Magic. And then when they finally get breakthrough, you know, Reggie was, wasn't in his prime. That year of 2000, when they, when they played the Lakers, Reggie Miller was, was, you know, he wasn't Reggie Miller from 95 and 96. That's when Reggie was in the zone, locked in. And, and I don't think even then when they played the Lakers, I think the Lakers had so much more talent than the Pacers. And they lost in six. And it really, I don't think anybody ever really thought the Pacers were going to win that series. I think everybody knew it was the Lakers. Here. Like Lakers had to basically implode like they did against Detroit to lose that series. So that's who the, that's who the Rockets remind me of is those Pacers team from the, from the nineties. They were always in it. They were always good, but they just couldn't quite get over the hump. Um, now there's so many options for LeBron. I mean, everybody's talking about Philly, Houston. The Lakers staying with the Cavs, uh, San Antonio, where I like to see him go personally. I like to see him go to San Antonio because if he goes there, then nobody can accuse him of doing what Durant did, joining the team that was already stacked and ready to go. Cause honestly, San Antonio lost in the first round of NBA finals. And I think LeBron has never had a Hall of Fame coach coach him. I mean, I think Tyron Lue's a good coach, but he's not, he's not like uh, uh, Popovich or, or Brad Stevens or Phil Jackson. Uh, he's, a, he's a good coach. He's, he's very much like Eric Spolstra. He benefited from LeBron, and he is a good coach. He'll probably be coaching for the next 20 years, uh, God willing, with good health. Uh, but I, personally, I'd like to see LeBron in San Antonio. Just If they can keep Kawhi Leonard and bring LeBron in, Nobody's gonna get a rebound in a tie game and 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 dribble the ball out. Pop is gonna make sure everybody's locked in, and no, <laughs> he makes sure he gets those players like that. Uh, so that that'd be my first choice. Second choice for me would be Houston, obviously, because I think it's it's the best chance for him to get a ring. Uh, so I just I think you doesn't go to Philly. Uh, he's definitely not going to Boston. He's not going there, and I think it'd be for LeBron's legacy. I think he's better off going to the West because, you know, I, if he goes to the West, then the power shifts completely to the Western Conference. And granted, he might not make it to the NBA Finals because he's got to get through Golden State. But if he gets through Golden State, then I think the NBA Finals would be a cakewalk, which whatever team he's on, and, and that's including Boston. That's how I see it. I think San Antonio one, Houston two, uh, and people are talking about the Lakers, but I, I don't know. I don't know, Lakers got too many holes to fill. And if he stays in Cleveland, only problem with LeBron staying in Cleveland is LeBron's got to commit first. Like he's got to say, I'm staying. And then he's got to trust management to bring in some big time free agents. And I don't want to hear, well, they got the number eight pick. It, it's rare 
anymore. An NBA rookie comes in and just completely impacts the team. I, and, and you you never know what it is. I mean, look look at Philly. They had a number one pick. Didn't do much. Lonzo Ball, number two pick. Did okay. I mean, w- without without his dad and the hype, he was just a decent uh, first-round player this year. He was good. Wasn't great. Had his moments, but he, he wasn't like some NBA all-star. And then you got Donovan Mitchell. He was like the 13th pick. And, and Ben Simmons wasn't even really a rookie. That's, that's year two in my book. So you look at those rookies. Uh, and Jason Tatum from Boston, you know, but he, he came on towards the end of the season where he, they had to step up. Uh, so the number eight pick doesn't hold a lot of weight with me because you, you know, you don't know what you're getting. You, really, you can't rely on rookies. You gotta, you gotta, LeBron wants some veterans proven that, that he knows he can play with. He knows the personality. And and he's he's going to be the the man. So I think Houston, James Harden falls back. Let's let's LeBron do his thing. Chris Paul, we're going to find out if it's about a ring or the money with him. Because if he demands a max contract from Houston, that's basically saying we can't bring LeBron here. So I guarantee you, so many people are. So I guarantee you, so many people are texting LeBron this week, giving him a call, and like, you know what, Le- you know what LeBron's going to do. He's going to be like, right now, I'm just going to sit back, get away with my family, and then we're going to discuss it. So you're going to see his Instagram, and he's going to be in Hawaii or Bora Bora. Uh, he's going to be at some house or resort that 9% of the country can't afford. He's going to His wife, Savannah, is going to have some bomb Instagram Snapchat post, and that's where you're going to have that discussion, where should I go? But when he's over there in one of these exotic places, trust his phone's buzzing. With, with, come here, man, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. So, but no matter where he goes, Golden State's still going to be favored to win the NBA title. And then LeBron's going to be, he's going to be second. So, on a, um, on a sad note, uh, Anthony Bourdain committed suicide last week. Uh, it's crazy because, you know, mental health and depression is real. And usually I, I would think when somebody's in a, in, a, in a state where they're depressed, it's usually life ain't going right for them. They lost their job or, or relationships aren't right and everything. Anthony Bourdain died in his hotel room and he was, he was working on his TV show. He was over in Europe. So in most people's world, he's got everything going for him. Because I, 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 I'm the type that when I'm on set, I'm the happiest. I mean, I love being on the road. Don't get it twisted. I, that. It makes life worth living for me is doing stand-up. I hope I have a a life like Don Rickles where I'm just doing stand-up up until I pass away. So for me, when my day's going bad and and things ain't right, I always know I can get on stage. It just makes me feel good when I'm on stage. Like sometimes I just get this sense of of everything's right in the world when I'm on stage. And it's funny, it always comes on like the late show Saturday if I'm at a comedy club or Sunday. Because two things are happening there. One, I'm on stage. And the crowd's laughing, and 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 I feel like they're they're a part of my life, and and I'm validated with my jokes. And two, I know I got a check coming. Like, <laughs> like Sundays are the best days for standups because you're like, oh my god, I'm about to get a check. I'm about to get paid. And let me tell you something. That shit never gets old. The end of the week at a comedy club when you go into the manager's office and they got a check for you. I don't care if that check's a hundred thousand or a hundred dollars. That shit never gets old. That's one of my favorite moments in in the entertainment business is that. So if somebody was to tell me I can't do stand-up anymore, you're not allowed, and I don't have any acting gigs or or TV appearances coming up, I would be in a, I don't know if I'd be depressed or, I wouldn't be suicidal depressed, but I'd be down. I guarantee I'd be down. I wouldn't be happy and perky like I am. I'd be, I could. I guarantee you this, I couldn't watch TV. There's no way, if I'm not doing stand-up, and I don't have any movie or TV gigs coming up, that would make me depressed watching other people on TV because I'd be like, they're living their dreams. That, you know, it's a, it's a little jealousy factor, honestly. It'd be like, well, they're living their dreams and I'm sitting here wanting to be on there. And I can't. And so for Anthony Bourdain to commit suicide, it, it's, it's a level of depression I can't even fathom because in my eyes, he's doing what he loves. He's on a TV show. He's filming his TV show. He's in Europe and, you know, he's traveling the world. What he wants to do, he, he's, 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 he like opened people's eyes to getting a passport and traveling. 
Uh, and I always tell people, man, my kid's got a passport at like eight years old because you never know when you get a chance to go somewhere. And, and when you don't have a passport, it, it, it's not like being in prison, but you are trapped. You are confined to a certain area. When you have a passport, you can go wherever you want, pretty much. So it's sad. And I didn't realize the impact Anthony Bourdain had on people until he passed away. And I saw everybody on Instagram making posts. White, black, old, young, hip hop, country. Everybody was talking about, we can't believe it. He, you know, and everybody said the same thing. You just opened my eyes to what a big world we have. Travel with your kids. Tra travel with your kids, man. Because when you got kids growing up, if they never travel, and you live, especially if you live in a small town, you get caught up in that cycle of this is my whole world and I have to work here and you don't get outside of it. And then if you don't ever travel and then when you travel as an adult, you feel out of place. You feel like, oh, I don't belong here. My home is back in this small town. And I always tell man, get out, travel. And I don't care. You ain't got to get on a plane. You can go an hour down the road. If you live in the city, drive your kids to the country. Uh, if you live in the country, drive your kids to a city and just explore I and mean, just get out. I mean, there's so much, there's so much shit in this world, man. There's so much shit I want to see. I ain't, I ain't been to Egypt yet. I ain't been to Australia yet. You know, I've been, I've been to Dubai. I've been to Qatar. I've been to Germany. I've been to Amsterdam. I've been to Japan numerous times, South Korea, obviously not North Korea. That's one place I don't want to go. Been to South Korea numerous times, you know, Hawaii. I've been to every Caribbean island, been to Canada, been to Mexico. Uh, so I've, you know, I've seen a lot. And this is, this is what I learned when, when I travel. I always come back home and I feel like I know more than when I left. I feel like when I'm out, I feel like I got a secret that some people don't have. Like, you don't know where I was just at. You know, this is how they do it there. And, and I always like to strike up a conversation with locals. I had a, when I was in Japan one time, we stopped at like a, like a rest stop in the middle of Japan. And I had an entire conversation and interaction with this Japanese dude, and he didn't speak English. And I didn't speak Japanese. Yet we sat there and had a cup of coffee and had a whole conversation just, just figuring it out. And we was laughing and cutting up because we both realized we don't know what the fuck each other's talking about. <laughs> but he came up. What happened? Here's how we started the conversation. I was, I was, I was traveling through Japan with this guy named Daniel Dugar and Rodney Perry. And, and Dugar is a comic out of the Bay Area, and he's, he's got this military account. So he brings a lot of comics to all these military bases all over the earth. So we did like this two-week run through Japan. We did like eight military bases, and we stopped at a, a rest stop, and D Dugar had this, uh, for some reason, he had a goatee at this time, and it came down. It was like a long goatee. When I tell you this Japanese guy walked up to Dugar, grabbed his goatee and like touched it motherfucker touched touched the black dude's goatee right <laughs> and he just like rubbed it with his fingers and he goes he goes he goes beautiful beautiful <laughs> and it was just like dude i laughed i lost it and then dugar just kind of looked stunned like this motherfucker just touched my goatee but he and it, was, it wasn't like some homosexual shit it wasn't anything like that he was an older gentleman he just went beautiful. And that's like the only word he had. So then I start, I start having a con tried to have a conversation with them. And then I was like, I'm from Ohio. And I pulled up my phone and I, I like showed him on that where I was from. And he's like, ah, oh. and I was like, ha have you been, you been? And he goes, no, no. And he, you know, we were trying to have a conversation, but, but it was just funny. And I even took a picture with the dude and I posted it on my Instagram. And I said, in the end, people are people. And there's more nice people than mean people out there. I said, I just had a, a five minute conversation with the, with the gentleman that's from a different country, different culture. We don't have a lot in common. I said, but we both like coffee. Cause I had a cup of coffee and he had a cup of coffee. And that, that's pretty much what bonded us right there. It was, it was a cool, uh, experience that in a, in the big scheme of things wasn't a big deal, but it was just cool. But when he grabbed Dugar's goatee, whoo, if that would happen in the States, that might have been a fight. You know, uh, Dugar was even like, his, ar his guard was down like, whoa. <laughs> he literally just grabbed it. Beautiful, beautiful. He was like, <laughs> he took his thumb and his index finger. And he just grabbed it with two fingers. And just like, 
caressed it for a hot second. I was like, what the fuck? So that's how I always tell parents, man, make sure you travel with your kids. You know, even as an adult, I just enjoy traveling. And that's why I think I got the best job in the world. I couldn't pick a better job than, than being a stand-up. But one thing I was getting at with, I got sidetracked with Anthony Bourdain is, you know, I've never been depressed to the point where I thought about, you know, killing myself seriously. But I, I did have one instance in high school. If, if anybody's listening to this, this is why I always say, man, uh, you know, don't always, don't always think that, that when somebody's being an asshole or, or a dick or, you know, is mean to everybody. I'm all, whenever I see like mean people are just mean for no reason. I'd be like, what got them to that point? It's almost like when I see a homeless person out on the streets, I'm like, how did they get to that point? Because everybody, everybody was a baby. Everybody at some point had to have somebody take care of them to make it. At what point did you either have people stop caring for you or you just stop caring for yourself? And what was that breaking point? Homeless is interesting and mental health is, it's interesting when you, when people do documentaries on it. Because some homeless people want to be homeless. And you see those crazy people that just are talking to themselves in the streets. You're like, how do they get to that breaking point? And I think, you know, with mental health and depression, it goes hand in hand because it's either when you have a mental health problem and you are depressed, I think it's either you get to that breaking point where you see a lot of those people end up homeless and talking to themselves or they commit suicide. And when I was growing up, there was only one point where I was like, I really crossed my brain. Damn, if I die, right now, then everybody's going to feel bad for not, for not noticing me or not liking me. And I remember I was, a, I was a junior in high school and it was actually the summer. It was a summer. No, no, no. I'm sorry. It was the, it was, I think it was my sophomore year. I think it was my sophomore year of high school. And I was on the football team and I wasn't playing, you know, it just time was, it was rough at home. And, uh, I skipped football practice on Tuesday and I skipped football practice on Wednesday. And we had these train tracks that ran behind my high school. And those train tracks, you could walk them, and it was probably three or four miles, and it would end up right in the back of the trailer park. The train tracks ran all the way from the trailer park all the way up to my small town, Oxford, Ohio, and they ran right behind the high school. So I could, I, I walked the tracks back Tuesday and Wednesday. I got out of school, and I just walked the, the train tracks home. And a couple times, uh, when you walk the tracks, you know, a train comes, you just got to step off to the side of the tracks and let the train go by. And I remember walking the tracks on Wednesday. I walked home Tuesday on the train tracks and I walked home Wednesday. And in my mind, I was like, man, if a, if a train comes, I'm just going to hop on it. I'm just going to hop on that train and I'm going to take off. I go, and then I'll disappear. And then everybody's going to be sorry that they weren't nice to me and nobody noticed me and all the other stuff. And, and I was really thinking about kids at school and I was thinking about my stepdad and mom, like then they'll be sorry. And then, the, and keep in mind, when I say a train coming to me, jumping on it, I don't know how I was going to jump on the train. I guess I thought there'd be a homeless dude on the train. Be like, hop on kid. You know, let his arm out. Come on, man. We're about to have an adventure. And then I was thinking, I'm going to join the circus <laughs> or I'll catch the train all the way to LA not knowing that these that, that this train ran north to south, not east to west. So me thinking I'm going to catch a train to L.A., I probably would have ended up in Atlanta or Mississippi or something. Uh, but then the thought hit me. I go, hmm, but what if a train come and I jumped in front of it? I was like, then I'm, I, I would die. Then everybody would feel bad. Then I'm thinking the football team would, would have a moment of silence at the game for me on Friday night. And, and I thought everyone would be crying. Everybody be at my funeral and they'd feel awful for not looking out for me. And thank God the uh, train never came. One, thank God a train never came. But so when I say I thought about jumping in front of the train, I don't think I would have did it if the train would have came. But the thought came across my brain though. Now, if, if a train would have came up, I, I probably would have really thought about jumping on it, depending on how fast it was going. Cause sometimes the trains go real slow. But if it had been like one of the fast trains, I'd be like, nah, fuck that. I'll just wait for a slow one. But thank God the train never came. But then Thursday, Thursday morning came, and my football coach was a big, he was an intimidating dude. His name was Doug Krause. This guy, he's actually in the um, the Hall of Fame of Miami of Ohio. He was a nose guard. 
uh, at Miami of Ohio, and he's in their college football, their, their Miami of Ohio football hall of fame. And people might say Miami of Ohio, what's that? There's been some good ball players come out of Miami of Ohio. Ben Roethlisberger, um, uh, Sherman Smith, who's still coaching in the league. Uh, he was running back for the Seahawks. I mean, there's always a few guys in the NFL from Miami of Ohio. But our football coach was a librarian in high school. And he pulled me aside, and he literally, like, pulls me out the hallway, and no, no, nobody's around. He goes, Gary, and he claps his hand, and he puts his hands right in front of his mouth. He goes, and then he, he like, points his hand towards me. He goes, it's kind of my attention. You haven't been to practice the last two days. And I was like, yeah. He goes, um, he goes, look, man, you're an important part of this team. We need you. He was like, so you going to be at practice today? Are you, you want to be on this team? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. He goes, all right, you going to be there today? We need you. And I was like, I'll be there. Look, they didn't fucking need me. But the fact that my coach, and I don't know which coach noticed if it was Coach Krause or not, but the fact that the coaching staff noticed I wasn't at practice and the fact that he pulled me out in the hallway and told me, I need you. We need you. They didn't fucking need me. I didn't play. But he said they needed me. And I'll tell you this. I never missed another fucking practice ever. I never missed the summer practices, the workouts. My junior year, I was at everything. And I, I never really was a great football player. I was average at best, but I felt like I was a part of something. And that, that coach pulled me aside, changed everything. I, everything after that in high school changed for me. Like then I, you know, and great, I hit puberty a little bit, but, uh, I had more confidence. People wasn't laughing at me anymore. I was making sure I was making people laugh at, at what I was saying. Not, not, you know, Hey, look at me. I'm, I'm a loser. That was gone. I was, I started bagging on kids in a fun way. Like I remember, I remember taking a bus ride home after a game, my junior year of high school. And, and we had this guy named Tony Irwin. It was, it was a, a really good high school football player. And we were just bagging on each other on, on the, the bus ride home. And he said, uh, he made a comment about me living in a trailer park and how I, w- I wasn't shit or something like that, or a tornado comes and, and I, you know, my f- house would be gone. So then I said, well, look, man, well, you live in a house. I said next year, uh, no, this had to be our senior year. Yeah. I said next year when you go to college and live in a dorm or you live in an apartment, you're stepping down in life. I said, I'm in a trailer park. I said, no matter where I live the rest of my life, I'm going up. <laughs> I'm going up in life. You got to go down because you ain't going to be in a house next year. And then he said, he said, he said something like, you want to know what Gary's mom tastes like? And I said, Sonia, Sonia was his girlfriend. Man, the bus lost it. It was the timing of it because we were going back and forth and it was, it was all in fun. We was laughing and he was like, Hey, everybody want to know what Gary's mom tastes like? I was like, Sonia. (laughs) It was like, Tony got mad. He said, well, beat your ass when we get off the bus. I said, oh, now you mad. Now you mad. And he ended up having to laugh because when you got everybody laughing and you're the only one mad, it's you. So he had to take that L. But I would have never did that if my coach would have pulled me aside. It just goes to show, man, um, that one moment, more than anything, changed the direction of my life. I, I could really look at that moment in the hallway when my coach pulled me aside. Completely did a 180 with how I felt about myself. And I'll incorporate this with, with, a, with a crazy stepdad story was even that, that my, my sophomore year of high school, I'll never forget, I busted my ass to try out for the, the, the baseball team. And I got cut and the head coach of the, the, the varsity team pulled me aside and he goes, Gary, ma'am, you were the last person we cut. We couldn't decide to keep you or not. And he was like, but he said, we only have 15 spots. He goes, but I want you to be the manager. He said, if somebody becomes ineligible or gets hurt, then we can put you on the team. So I want you being on the team, being a practice, but we can't put you on a, on a game roster until somebody becomes ineligible and gets hurt. And I come home and I asked my stepdad, I was like, hey, uh, I don't know why I went to him for advice. This was dumb. He goes, hey, uh, the, the varsity coach said I was the last guy that got cut. And he said he, he really, they debated for a long time whether to keep me or not. So he wants to bring me on as the manager. And then if somebody becomes ineligible or gets hurt, I'll be on the team. You know, I'm thinking it's going to be like, well, do it, man. You know, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get a bad grade. Nah, it's my step there. Manager? I would never do that shit, man. Every time I, the manager of the baseball team was like the loser kids. What are you going to do? Carry people's Gatorade around and the bats. 
So then you you got to do everything. You got to clean up. You you a janitor is what you are. You a, I never get that said. You a janitor. I was like, thanks, Dad. Appreciate that. <laughs> I ended up becoming the manager. I said I, I went back and told the coach, yeah, I want to do it. Man, it wasn't two days later. A kid got like two Fs. He was off the team. He was ineligible. So I was on the team after that. But I, I don't even know why I went to my stepdad for that. That was stupid. So anyways, uh, so yeah, the, the Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain, I didn't realize the impact he had on so many people. Listen, I, I, I'm on the road a lot as a stand-up, and I watch a lot of Netflix. I watch a lot of TV. Uh, I, I, it's funny. The show I've been watching a lot lately, and I don't know why, is Undercover Boss. Uh, that show right there, it's a good show. Uh, you got to watch it by yourself, because if you're a softie, you might tear up. But I don't realize there are, Though they, I don't know where they get these undercover boss guys at and how they get these, these workers that have these terrible backstories. It reminds me of watching like American Idol on The Voice and they always show somebody with this terrible backstory and they're like, I just want to sing for my family or stuff like that. <laughs> undercover boss, man. It'd be like the boss is trying to, if you don't know what undercover boss is, they'll find the CEO of some kind of corporation. Let's say Fuddruckers. And the CEO of Fuddruckers will go undercover and put a wig on, glasses, and he or she will go into different Fuddruckers across the country and see how they're being ran. And, and they'll get to know people. Like, they'll get to know the chef. They'll get to know the electrician. They'll get to know the, the GM, stuff like that. But at some point during the day, the undercover boss is going to sit down and have lunch during a work day. And, uh, and whoever is training him or her and whatever they're doing will open up about their life. That, and it's always some crazy sob story. You know, like, you know, I, I got a daughter and she's not doing well. And I just want to send her to college or I live with my mom and my mom's got cancer and she's got six months to live. So my paycheck goes to her. And then at the end, the, the undercover boss will bring everybody in to, uh, to his office and then he'll be dressed as a CEO now and be like, no way. That was you with the wig and glasses. And they'll be like, yeah, I'm, I'm Frank Smith. I'm the head of Fuddruckers. Listen, I listened to your story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a raise. I'm going to give you $20,000. And I want you and your mom to go on vacation. I'm going to pay for it. They'll say things like that. But it, it's, it's getting to a point where I watch it. I'm like, this is, this, this, I don't even know if it's real anymore. Because they, they be giving people crazy stuff. And it's all, like, wow, they find these people with these terrible backstories. Just randomly. It's kind of crazy. You know, he goes, uh, um, listen, I heard your story. I know your son is blind. So I'm going to give your son my eyes. Your son's going to have my eyes. Your son's going to be able to see. I'll go blind. No way. You're going to give my son your eyes? I want your son to have my eyes. I heard your story. I want him to have my eyes. I heard, I, okay, I heard that your sister is a transgender. I'm going to give her my cock. I'm going to cut off my cock and give my cock to your sister. I want her to experience having a dick. I want that. I never open up like that to people that quick. It took me 40 years to open up about my past. These people just open up with it, with the, there's, cam they see the cameras. It's not them sitting in a lunchroom. They, there's cameras there. They have to know the, they're, they're mic'd. They have to know. So there's people in the room with them and they're just open it up like that. So anyways, I like undercover boss, but sometimes I'm like, okay, what's the sob story? Nobody just has lunch and be like, how's it going, man? Good, man. You know, my kids are grown. They're in college. You know, the, I like my job. It's cool. And, Everything's going good. Nobody ever says that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just watch Undercover Boss and notice that shit. And then we're, we, we was a little bored the other day, so we went to the movie theater. And there's so many movies out there. You know, there's Solo and, and, and The Avengers and all this stuff. We went and saw this movie called Upgraded, which I didn't see a lot of promos for. And I like, like I always say, I like to see movies like a couple weeks after they come out just because I don't like a crowded theater. And I do like the movie going experience. There's nothing like going to a movie theater and seeing a movie. Uh, but we went and saw this movie Upgraded. And it had a bunch of people in it that I had seen in other movies but didn't really know their names. But it was a really good movie, man. If you guys get a chance to go see Upgraded, I don't want to tell you what it's about. Just trust me, it's a pretty freaking good movie. It's called Upgraded. And uh, the, I'll tell you one girl you would know in the movie. The girl from Get Out, the, the, the mom that was the maid, the black lady that was the maid that ended up being the white family's mom, her brain, she's in it. And she actually looks pretty good in the movie because she looks scary as shit and get out. I was like, I wouldn't, I don't know who's dating her, but I'd be scared to date her at this point because every time she'd be looking at me, I'd be like, oh shit, you better take off your wig. You better come after me. 
Like, there's no way I could, as a dude, I was like, God, I, there's no way I could sleep with her. There's just no way. I'd be looking at her like, what you about to do? Is this you? Am I fucking you? Or somebody else? Uh, cause she played that role to the hill, man. She was scary as shit. But in this movie, I'm great. She's a detective and she actually made herself up look pretty good. I was like, Oh, okay. Okay. I'll see you. She was acting, acting obviously completely different. And, and they, even being a detective, it's not like she's in some sexy role, but she looked pretty good. So it, it, it's a good movie. If you guys get a chance, go see the movie or look it up, upgrade it. And it's a, it's just a bunch of people in the movie that I've seen in other movies, but I don't really know who they are, the names. But there's some fight scenes in that movie that are hysterical and uh, crazy. Like there's always, there's always movies like like The Matrix that, that comes out. You're like, whoa, how'd they do that? It's very similar to this movie, Upgraded. The fight scenes in here are crazy. Like the camera angles and how they shot them. You're just like, how did they do that? And it's dope. And they they make it almost comical. The fight scenes, even though it's not a comedy. The, the main dude, he's, he's got some funny lines in it. So I recommend the movie Upgraded, a movie that you probably ain't heard about uh, to go see. And uh, listen, I always say I love being in the entertainment business because you never know when a phone call might come. And I told you I've been on a drought with acting and everything. Well, all of a sudden, I get a couple phone calls. And this is how it works in this business. You'll go months and won't get shit. And then you'll get like three offers and they're all at the same time. And you got to make a decision. That shit kills me. So over the last week and a half, here's what happened with me. Will Packer called me, uh, and he, he offered me a part in this movie, Little, which got Issa Rae, Regina Hall, the the young lady from Blackish, and they start filming in mid June. So he goes, Gary, I want to bring you in. It's it's not a huge part, but it's a cool part. I was like, Cool, yeah, man, I'm down. And at the same time, I get called to shoot this uh this TV pilot, right? And I'm not, I can't really say what it's about yet, but it, it's a pilot. It's a legit pilot. And, and I told Will, I said, look, the only days I can't work are these three days in June. And then Will calls me back. He goes, you're not going to believe this shit, bro. The three days you're shooting, you're, the pilot is the same three days we need you for a little. I said, what the fuck? So now, now I got to make a choice. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, as of this moment, I still don't know. I still don't know which one I'm going to do. There's a lot that goes into it. Obviously, money is a factor. and and uh, and what's 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 going to benefit me the most in the long run? Is it going to be this movie Little or is it going to be this pilot? Now, with the pilot, you're taking a risk because when you shoot a TV pilot, there's no guarantee it's going to get picked up. Where the movie Little, you know it's going to be in theaters in 2019. So it's like, uh, you know, in, in, in a perfect world, in success, the pilot is more beneficial for me. But the guarantee is the movie Little, because you know I'm going to be on the big screen and people are going to see me. So I, I still haven't decided. We're still I'm still talking with my agent and my manager, and we got to make a decision like in the next couple of days. But we, I don't know yet. And then on top of that, I get offered this this movie on Netflix, and I, we were going to start shooting in June, but now they thank God they they pushed it to the fall. And it, when they push a movie, it can get pushed again. But the fact that I got I told you I've had a lull in, in, in movies, and then I get I get two phone calls uh, less than a week apart for two different movies. I just it's crazy how this business works. That's what I'm saying. You never know. You get a phone kind of left field, and uh, that's why I love the entertainment business, and that's why you can't get frustrated and you can't go off on people. And you're sitting there like, why is all this shit at the same time? But it's it's the problems you want to have. You want to be like, what should I do? You don't want to be like, ah, I got nothing. You know, I would love to be like, yes, I'll do it. And then I just go start filming. But, it, you know, it's it's good problems to have in the entertainment business when you're deciding, do I want to shoot this or do I want to shoot this? Which one do I want to do? But I got to make a decision in the next couple of days. So we'll see what happens. Anyways, um, that's all I got for this week, man. Again, rest in peace, Anthony Bourdain. This will be the last one where there's no video, hopefully, because next week's podcast I will have a video on YouTube that goes with it. And I and, and it depends on how this 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 studio and this videographer I found and how he does, but if he if he does it right, then I'll be doing videos from now on. But but the next podcast, next week's will be a video. So I'm excited. So all right, y'all. Thanks for listening. This is another episode of the Gary Owen Gissa podcast.